Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Welcome to our conversation today, our online panel discussion today on Europe and the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much for joining us from across the world, from Europe, of course, Asia, and also, although it's very early, from the United States. It's wonderful to have you here. It's also wonderful to have Gunnar Wiegand here. Gunnar Wiegand is, of course, the Managing Director for the Asia Pacific at the European External Action Service. But that title doesn't say it all. I have to say, Gunnar, I've uh, been watching and writing and analyzing EU-Asia relations for several decades now. And you are one of the leading architects of this new Indo-Pacific strategy. And not only the architect, but also in a way the construction worker. With your team, you've been on site in Asia building the strategy brick by brick and during the pandemic actually on Zoom, link by link. So it's really wonderful to get your insights here. The EU foreign ministers, of course, agreed on the broad outlines of the strategy uh, earlier, I think at this month, mid-month, but we need to know a little bit about what's missing and what's in it as well from you. But it's all very well to hear uh, from the European Union. We also need to get reactions from our colleagues and our partners across the world, across Asia, and in this case, the United States. So we've been, uh, we brought in Lewi. Uh, Yu Lewi is the director for the EU Center in Singapore. And of course, she's a good colleague of mine. We've written several papers together. So Lewi, thank you for joining us and bringing us the ASEAN point of view. Also with us is Sunil Casey. He is uh, the chief executive of the Asian Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs in Kathmandu in Nepal, and also a very good friend of EPC and a colleague of mine. And joining us from the United States at 6 a.m. in the morning is Rachel Esplin Odell. She's research fellow at the East Asia program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. I'm Shada Islam, I'm senior advisor at EPC. So where uh, rules of the game are very, very simple, I'm going to uh, interrogate or quiz Gunnar for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then turn to my colleagues uh, for their comments and their reactions to what Gunnar says. And of course, this is as always uh, interactive. So please ask your questions, please make them short in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. So Gunnar, before, uh, I, I get too lengthy about the introduction. Let me just say thank you once again for joining us. Now, the EU Indo-Pacific strategy obviously comes after the Dutch one, the German and the French one, um, the British also not in the EU, but have their strategy as well. And there's a lot of interest uh, in Asia, in America, in Europe, of course, also about what makes this difference what is the value added? What can you do differently in the Indo-Pacific from the other actors in the region, including our own European member states? So Gunnar, that's my first question to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me first underline the EU is not a newcomer to the region. Uh, we have a strong presence. Uh, we are in with many of the partners in the region. We are number one or number two trade partner number one and number two investment partner. So our economic profile is under no doubt. Um, we have, of course, many historic links also to most uh, countries of the region uh, over the centuries. Uh, Europe has never delinked or decoupled from Asia and will not delink or decouple from Asia. Uh, so this is about um, uh, an enabling framework which provides value added for a better projection of uh, EU policies and programs across the wider region, taking into account that both the Indian Ocean as well as the Pacific Ocean as huge maritime spaces provide challenges on their own. So this is not to say that our policy in Asia and Pacific is suddenly just an Indo-Pacific policy. It is the additionality of better concentration better focus for the specific needs of this most dynamic part of the world's economy on this most creative part of the world's economy on the most challenging part in terms of environmental degradation and climate change contributions, but also on the part of the world where you have unfortunately no security architecture, unfortunately the most traditional geopolitical tensions uh, and rivalries. 
and therefore it is not a um, coincidence that the European um, strategy for the Indo-Pacific is called the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. That's the distinct approach of Europe. This is our historic experience. We have overcome the division of Europe. We have overcome several world wars impact and we have united a large part of the European uh, states in the European Union. And it is with that cooperative framework, supporting regional organizations, whether this is uh, SAC or BIMSTEC, whether this is the Indian Ocean Rim Association or the Pacific Islands Forum, with it this, and of course, we are building on a long, strong, and now strategic partnership with ASEAN in supporting regional integration and regional cooperation. Nobody else has that. European Union has it. And we have, of course, also a lot of experience in cooperative security uh, operations uh, in Europe and beyond, and we want to do more of this. Let me finalize by saying the key areas of engagement, of additional engagement on the basis of existing policies will be on health for obvious reasons. In, um, over in the socioeconomic recovery is one, but dealing with a specific health challenges we all are subject to will be on the economic side with uh, uh, strengthened uh, work on the trade and investment liberalization uh, while uh, promoting green circular economies and digital economies and reducing critical vulnerabilities in supply chains. The third main area will be on uh, climate change, uh, ocean governance, fisheries, over fisheries, I have to say, and massive marine pollution and the promotion or rather the protection of biodiversity. Uh, another area will be increased work on uh, research technology and education exchanges. Uh, connectivity agenda, well known now for a few years, will get an additional uh, boost. Uh, and um, I would like to say after the connectivity partnership with Japan, two years ago, we are going to have a connectivity partnership with India in the next few days. And we will do more on security and defense cooperation, uh, which is uh, perhaps the least well known. Uh, and it is a accelerating cooperation, which I can detail uh, later. Uh, I finish by saying that what I said about strengthening work with regional organizations is one element, but also to work more with partners of the Indo-Pacific region in the multilateral context, because we want to have not just a multipolar world, but we want to have a multipolar world with the same multilateral rules for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So a real opportunity, as you said, Gunnar, to reinvigorate and re-energize this relationship, made it, make, make it even more sort of focused on the real challenges in the region when it comes to health, the economic recovery, climate change, and of course, connectivity being very important, but also the EU starting a conversation on cooperative security. So I'm sure there'll be quite a lot of questions on all these uh, issues. But what's also interesting about this document, which as you know, we've all been looking at for the last few weeks, is really what's missing from it, if I may say so, missing in emphasis, if not, uh, there are references perhaps, but missing in, 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 in context. One is really the South Asian angle. I mean, you mentioned SARC, this Association for South Asian Cooperation in your comments just now, but really the focus seems to be very much on the Indo-Pacific per se, rather than also South Asia, whereas we know this relationship needs also to be enhanced more globally. Um, also, you don't really reference the Quad, and the Quad is emerging in the region as quite a sort of, some would say, as an unofficial Asian NATO. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. And my third point about what seems to be sort of missing in emphasis is also the Asia-Europe meetings, ASEMS, uh, which is developed into quite an interesting format, informal format for discussion and geopolitical sort of conversations. So very quickly on those three, can you sort of reassure us about some of these questions? Well, usually uh, European Union is criticized for having uh, not enough, but uh, rarely are we praised for 
what we actually do. So uh, I'm, uh, I would like to emphasize that you very rarely have council conclusions of our foreign ministers, which are 10 pages long. I wonder how often it actually has happened. So there's a lot in it. And uh, not everyone is mentioned with whom we want to work, but regional organizations have been mentioned with whom we want to work. And of course, SARC is one of them. And I would hope that SARC would um, indeed have a more intensive uh, use by its own membership of its potential. And we have a participant from Nepal here who, who lives where the secretariat is. Uh, we have no problem. It's as long as the members of the regional organization actually want to make use of that regional organization. And we will work with any regional organization which works and delivers for its constituents. Um, the uh, policy of course includes all of South Asia because the Indian Ocean um, is very much part of this. And when we say we want to extend the geographic scope of our work with uh, coast guards and navies in the Climario activities, which are currently in the Indian Ocean, we say into also South Asia and Southeast Asia, um, to contribute to safer sea lanes of communication uh, with the EU. Uh, and we do include the sentence to reinforce cooperation further with multilateral and regional organizations in the Indo-Pacific, and that does indeed cover uh, SARC. Um, now, um, I will not um, talk much about the Quad. Uh, the Quad is um, a very important uh, intergovernmental cooperation between four partners. Uh, and uh, we are uh, glad that this uh, takes place um, as there are also other intergovernmental forms of cooperation between different partners in the region, sometimes two, three, four. Um, you could also talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, if you want to talk about the beginnings of NATO. I think neither the Quad nor the Shanghai Cooperation Organization have actually the cohesion and the capacities of NATO, um, the, nor, nor, nor the treaty base of, uh, and mutual assistance. Um, so I would be careful in comparing what, however, is for us interesting and is important is that uh, four like-minded partners uh, who all have active Indo-Pacific policies beyond the obvious foreign and security policy the consultations they have, have now also agreed to work more on vaccines, on climate change and on technologies. There indeed, we do have much more of uh, uh, overlap where we could uh, indeed work closer with partners. And it is perhaps for those who read these long counts conclusions carefully, there is a mention that we will work with all partners with whom we have shared interests, but we work in particular with those also who have already an Indo-Pacific policy. And therefore that means that uh, notably those four countries which are in the court and who, which do have these policies. Lastly, ASEM is a comprehensive platform for uh, cooperation, for mutual understanding between very diverse views and cultures. Uh, I would like to recall that it includes um, 53 uh, top level participants. Um, and um, this includes uh, 27 member states and the institutions of the EU. And it includes many, uh, almost all Asian uh, nations, including, of course, China and including, of course, the Russian Federation, which has also a large landmass in Asia. And uh, we are uh, preparing for the next summit uh, in uh, end November, which will take place in Cambodia. The fact that the EU will have by then its Indo-Pacific policy uh, will be important also in this context. But uh, it is, of course, a wider uh, group of countries here, which um, is uh, faced in particular with the urgent need to find more contributions to global challenges uh, from climate change to biodiversity, but in particular on socioeconomic recovery and on the health challenges. Uh, so we will continue our work in the ASEM context without any difficulties. And uh, Vietnam has offered uh, in a couple of weeks to hold a 
major event, including at political level, to celebrate the fact that Asen will turn 25 years old uh, this year. Our time flies. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that. A final point before I turn to our commentators. Um, so the EU reference is very much in the, uh, at the beginning on the intense geopolitical competition uh, under underway there, obviously references to US and China playing great power games there. But some of the tensions and some of the challenges you know, in the region uh, are, are not just because of geopolitics, it's also frail governance. Um, and the case of Myanmar, of course, is a very striking one at the moment. So I was just wondering your comments about also the other challenges, say populism, nationalism, uh, all the other questions of you know, discrimination against ethnic minorities, actually challenges that we here in Europe face as well. So Myanmar being a point where actually governance is at stake in ASEAN manifestly, despite recent efforts uh, under Indonesia's guidance to up the game vis-a-vis -vis Myanmar has been quite, let's say, ineffective. Let's be clear, the Indo-Pacific uh, cooperation strategy of the EU is not a panacea uh, for everything which happens in this part of the world, which covers uh, the largest global area from east coast of Africa to the Pacific Islands um, and is not designed for it. I, I, therefore, I insist value added, uh, better focus in a few uh, clearly defined policy areas. Uh, we have we continue to have our Japan policy, our Korea policy, our China policy, our ASEAN policy, our India policy, and so on. Uh, the, so it's not the overarching label for everything which happens in this large part of the world. And there are, of course, many bilateral relations. We are deeply uh, concerned and highly critical of the situation in Myanmar. We have made no... Uh, uh, we, we have not hidden that criticism, and we have now had two rounds of sanctions, including against military conglomerates. Uh, we have um, called for, uh, we are supportive of the efforts of ASEAN. Uh, it was an important meeting which took place in Indonesia. Uh, we do believe that uh, finally this political process must start uh, between the military uh, junta and the national unity government of the opposition. Um, and uh, we will uh, say so publicly very soon, but we add an important uh, uh, part, which is the release of all political prisoners since the coup. Uh, how can you have a dialogue between two sides if one side is imprisoned? Um, and uh, this is key, and it was asked for by many ASEAN nations, uh, but it was not in the final five-point consensus because it seems that at least one participant didn't agree to that. Thank you very much. Let me thank you very much, Gunnar, for being very frank and open about all the different questions I put to you. Let me turn to you, uh, Lei Wei, uh, from Singapore. Now, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that the EU, actually, the European uh, External Action Service, waited for ASEAN to come up with its strategic outlook on the Indo-Pacific before bringing out its own. And there are certain elements of commonality there, obviously, with ASEAN, and a big focus, as Gunnar has pointed, to ASEAN centrality as well. Uh, viewed from your region, um, what do you see as the uh, key aspects of this Indo-Pacific strategy from the EU and how, what's the response being uh, across ASEAN? Yeah, uh, good afternoon uh, everyone and thank you Shada uh, for inviting me to this dialogue uh, organized by the EPC. I think, uh, as you have said, the ASEAN outlook on the uh, Asia, on the Indo-Pacific is actually premised on the fact that you know, the dynamic regions of the Asia Pacific and around the Indian Ocean are closely uh, integrated and that ASEAN and its member states can play a central role in connecting the regions. I think ASEAN takes a very open and inclusive approach towards Indo-Pacific and see it as a region of dialogue and cooperation rather than rivalry. Uh, ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific is meant to contribute to the maintenance of peace and promote development and prosperity for all. The outlook, I think, is ASEAN's efforts to really steer the region away from this growing narrative of strategic competition and to stress on common uh, interests uh, for development. Of course, we know ASEAN countries are not immune to the pools of the strategic forces uh, from outside the region. And with the rise of all these competing uh, Indo-Pacific strategies advocated by major powers, 
I think ASEAN faces the challenges of maintaining its uh, centrality amidst all these forces. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, the contribution from, uh, from EU, I hope, uh, will be different. Uh, to the extent that the EU strategy on the Indo-Pacific is also based on an inclusive and broad-based approach open to cooperation with all partners, I think there's much that the uh, EU and ASEAN can do together uh, to support each other's vision for a more uh, rule-based and cooperative uh, region. The EU and ASEAN have overlapping interests and uh, also a certain synergy in terms of the priorities on issues such as uh, ocean governance that uh, uh, Mr. Gunnar Wigan has, uh, has mentioned, you know, to tackle topics ranging from maritime safety, uh, freedom of navigation, anti-piracy, to common concerns over uh, marine pollution and sustainable development of uh, marine uh, resources. In both the ASEAN and EU uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, I think there's also priority placed on uh, connectivity. Uh, and again, there's much that both can do uh, to look into the two, the, the different dimensions of connectivity. Uh, so I think, you know, whether it's regards to sustainability, the standards and the norms, and not just the hard infrastructure. Another priority that's stated in the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy is to strengthen regional organizations, as we have heard, right? And I think this is particularly important for ASEAN uh, if it is to maintain its centrality uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So any commitment and support from the EU to strengthen ASEAN and shore up uh, ASEAN centrality will be a good start, I think, to the strategic partnership between uh, uh, EU and ASEAN. It remains, of course, to be seen whether both partners can reconcile the variety of values-based, sustainability-based, uh, military-based, and economic-based approaches to the Indo-Pacific, uh, and to filter the filter out the negative excesses of competition and rivalry. I think that's one thing we have to see how we can work together. One key difference I noted uh, when comparing the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy uh, to ASEAN's outlook is, of course, the geographical scope. Uh, Guna mentioned that the geographical scope of EU's Indo-Pacific spans from the east coast of Africa to the Pacific island states. For ASEAN, I think it has left the geography quite vague. But if you look into the outlook, you see that we insist on retaining the focus on the Asia-Pacific region. Hence, the, for ASEAN, the Indo-Pacific broadly is the interconnected space between the Asia-Pacific countries and the South Asian countries around the Indian Ocean. I think that is the uh, sort of uh, the scope that we are talking about. I think this intended uh, vagueness in geographical focus is ASEAN's very subtle way of rejecting what it sees as an implicit anti-China focus uh, when the US introduced the narrative of an Indo-Pacific uh, to replace its pivot towards Asia. This brings me to a broader issue that I, I would like to bring up concerning a certain unease in the way, or maybe not unease, but a question in my mind when the EU comes up with Indo-Pacific strategy. Although the court is not mentioned, uh, as you say, one could not but help wonder from us, at least, if the EU is in some way reacting to pressure from the US to frame an Indo-Pacific strategy. Where is the EU's strategic autonomy when it comes to reflecting on its own priorities? If I'm an policy, EU policymaker, on much closer reflections, I would probably give more priority to framing a Eurasian strategy with ASEM as a cornerstone, ASEM, which you have mentioned, right? So it made me wonder how often policies are made based on reactions rather than deep reflections of our own interests, our autonomy and our agency. So I end with that provocative note uh, and we can take the discussions uh, further. Thank you very much. Um, very, very valid points. Uh, EU strategy, inclusive connectivity, maritime security, norms and standards, and strengthening regional organizations. But also, Le, we thank you for bringing up the issue of Eurasia as well. Um, are we forgetting Eurasia in favor of uh, the Indo-Pacific? And is there uh, unconscious bias, if I may say so, using diversity language, 
um, in the Indo-Pacific strategy against China. Are we actually, is there something that we can call an Indo-Pacific state of mind, uh, which perhaps uh, Gunnar can uh, answer in a few minutes. Let me turn to Sunil as well. Sunil, so uh, you are of course in Nepal where you have the SARC secretariat and Gunnar has been quite explicit also about the need to work with SARC, but also that problems and the challenges that that poses because SARC itself is not very operational um, due to obvious uh, reasons. Uh, what is the reaction? Is, is there discussion about this Indo-Pacific strategy of the EU in uh, other South Asian countries outside uh, India, do you think? Uh, thank you, Sada, first of all, for your kind invitation. And it's a particular pleasure and delight to, to be a part of the EPC dialogue today on the Indo-Pacific, uh, EU Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, let me, you know, say some of my points, you know, in the beginning is like, you know, in the last decade, you know, the international order uh, has been, you know, centered around the rise of China. Uh, while many had, you know, predicted that the 21st, 21st century is the Asian century. So Asia is it, it a China-centric century, but for many, you know, it is a matter of worry and others See, it is a is an opportunity to align or strengthen with a mighty power like China. You know, however, China's you know power projection and expansionist outlook have resulted in intense geopolitical competition. As a result, you know, the concerned countries have formed group groupings like Quad, you know, who aims at a peaceful and free Indo-Pacific uh, region with freedom of navigation. Like, you know, the United States, India, Japan, Australia have well presented, you know, their democratic and liberal aspirations, you know, through Quad. You know, even I stay in Nepal and Nepal is a landlocked country, you know, it's part of the, uh, you know, SARC, South Asian Regional Corporation, where EU has been uh, in the observer status and EU has been supporting SARC in terms of technical and other uh, economic yards, you know, till the day and there has been a larger cooperation between uh, SARC and European Union, and I think uh, which uh, will be strengthened in days to come. But you know, like uh, uh, let's say that you know Nepal is a landlocked country. You know, between India and China, find you know itself as a in a critical geo strategic space. We may not be you know directly connected to the world through land or sea. Every development in the region has implications on Nepal as it relies on both of its neighbor. You know, while Quad members take the lead in protecting the Indo-Pacific region. The European Union's absence from the Indo-Pacific region at the policy level was worrying as the democrat democratization of the international order requires the active participation of all concerned countries. And uh, the EU is among uh, permanent right-based union to be participating. As we know, the Indo-Pacific region represents the world's economic and strategic center of gravity. It is home uh, for almost 60% of the world population and producing 60% as percentage of the global GDP, contributing you know two thirds of uh, current global growth. Even by 2030, you know the overwhelming majority, 90% of the 2.4 billion new members of the middle class entering the global economy will uh, live in the uh, live in the Indo-Pacific region. As you identifies uh, that 60% of all maritime trade passes through its oceans and including a third through the South China Sea, its passes uh, need to remain free and open. You know, hence the EU, along with other stakeholders, has a big stake in the Indo-Pacific region and has every interest that the regional architecture uh, remains open and rule-based. Therefore, it cannot be neglected. And in another point, you know, in this light, the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, is an outcome, you know, of the larger change in the maritime domain and the rise of a trade-based uh, global system. This has been brought about uh, not only by China's recent increased uh, military assertiveness and uh, political interference in Europe and elsewhere, but also, you know, uh, Europe's and others' increasing dependency on China for critical goods and materials, as well as the ideological war that the COVID-19 crisis presented us further. Uh, the use strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific uh, outline is the strategic focus and excellence, you know, with an aim towards uh, regional stability, security, prosperity, and sustainable development. In many senses, you know, this reflects the reconfiguration of the use Asia-Pacific approach to the Indo-Pacific, you know, given the changing uh, geopolitical situations. Uh, in Europe, you know, the EU member states like Germany, France, and the Netherlands have already 
articulated their Indo-Pacific strategy at the use strategy approved of the consensus among its 27 member states needs to be seen in the larger context of use for commitment to global peace, security, and order. Also, unlike China, you know, BRI, uh, huge firm support to the promotion of the democracy, rule of law, human rights, international law are not only seen as a crucial for stability and resilience of local societies, but also seen as a contribution to the EU's long-term strategic interest in the region and its role as a global security player. You know, uh, to conclude, you know, China is a challenge that has its arms around the world. Its intentions are clear, which stand as a worry to a politically fragmented South Asia. Organizations like SARC have become dysfunctional due to an ongoing tension between India and Pakistan, which is very well known to everyone, which do not seem to get involved, you know, like solved in near future. You know, with every move to the maritime domain, South Asian countries will have to think twice about securing their interest. While a strategic alliance between South Asia and Europe or America, cooperation will be the best way to start with, you know, more actors with similar interests and respect for the democratic norms. The Indo-Pacific regions will be more free and uh, uh, peaceful, you know. And, you know, like, let me tell you that the South Asian members, like recently, like in Mars, the Bangladeshi foreign minister has told that uh, they, won't pa they won't, you know, participate in the Indo-Pacific strategy led by U.S., even I will tell you that the South Asian member countries uh, include Sri Lanka and uh, uh, Nepal. They still uh, like uh, not pass the bill of Millennium Challenge Corporation and people viewed it as a part of the Indo-Pacific strategy, which was uh, like 500 million USD given by US government for the energy transmission project and road expansion project in Nepal and Sri Lanka. And there has been uh, viewed it as a part of the Indo-Pacific strategy and the people, you know, still not uh, clarified or like not convinced that what does it mean? Actually, the what does it mean the Indo-Pacific strategy? Because previously people were believing that it is a, it's like, you know, uh, Asia Pacific, something like this, you know, uh, we're working under that model. And as you know, that like South Asia is already part of the geographically part of the Indo-Pacific and uh, almost our trade happens through the Indo-Pacific. Right. But people you know, still believe that uh, you know, uh, these kind of projects belongs to the uh, somehow strategic, somehow like a military kind of cooperation. And you know, still till the day, even Nepal is not a part of the BRI, you know, officially. So it means that uh, the South Asian, South Asian members, they uh, are somehow giving the priority to have the bilateral cooperation than the multilateral, uh, you know, uh, engagements, you know, this is what I feel and uh, we'll have more conversation, uh, I'll have more debate in, in, in next question. So thank you so much, Shadha. Yeah. Thank you, Sunil. So uh, basically, uh, quite a constructive approach to the European Union strategy, basically also because it uh, will reinforce democrat democratic standards and a rule of law across the region. So well, well intentioned European Union and well received in uh, South Asia, you think, Sunil. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel, um, thank you very much for your patience as well. Um, United States is a very important player, of course, and America is back. Uh, Transatlantic trans warmth is back, uh, and there is a lot of coordination going on. Uh, Guna meets his American counterparts quite regularly, talking about Asia and China, of course, looms large over these conversations. Looking at the EU's strategy, do you see any um, possibilities of real engagement, transatlantic engagement and coordination in, in how they approach the, let's say, strategic challenges in, in that region? Yes, thank you. I appreciate the conversation so far, uh, and it's, it's an honor to be with all of you on this panel. I, I think that there are indeed some areas for potential cooperation. I, I would just begin by saying that I think it is still a little bit unclear exactly how this administration, the, the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy will unfold, how it might differ from that of the Trump administration, and as well as its sort of policy towards toward China and other countries in the region. Um, you know, they are undergoing a policy review uh, re regarding you know, U.S.-China policy and Asia policy more generally. So I think we will still see, you know, it's, we still have yet to see how some of that will unfold. Um, that said, 
you know, the, the United, of course, the Biden administration is placing a strong emphasis on re-engagement uh, across, across the Atlantic with Europe in coordinating uh, its policy around the world, especially vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, the Biden administration has really framed this cooperation with allies and partners in Europe and in Asia and elsewhere as central to its strategy towards the region. Now, I think that the Biden administration has clearly continued to take a more zero-sum approach toward this uh, coordination than is present in the EU strategy. I think that they hope to work with the European Union in, in ways in order to counter Chinese influence in many, many regards, which uh, does not, you know, doesn't, doesn't seem to be a strong emphasis of the, of the Indo-Pacific strategy of the European Union to its credit, I would say. And you know, so I think that there are still some areas of tension, some disagreements, although they're likely to probably be somewhat less, significantly less than under the previous administration. I think that areas where there's real potential for cooperation are in the areas of connectivity and, and development aid in, in the region. And this is one where, uh, you know, I think there are some limitations placed by the the sort of politics of trade and, and international economic cooperation in the United States at present, in that the Biden administration is sort of maintaining a lot of the uh, tariffs and other more punitive uh, trade policies adopted by the previous administration. They are certainly in no rush to remove some of those, but uh, I, do, I do, there are, you know, indications that the Biden administration, as well as Congress right now, which is uh, considering a, a number of pieces of legislation regarding, uh, especially regarding China. But these, le these pieces of legislation include an emphasis on um, economic engagement in the region, on uh, you know, providing more development assistance and transatlantic cooperation, specifically referring to something called the Strategic Competition Act that is sort of wending its way through Congress. And so, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a desire to enhance that transatlantic cooperation, but I think that there are some areas where, um, you know, of course there are differences between the European, between Europe and the United States on some standards related to privacy and, and other matters that the United States is still sorting out. So we'll sort of see how that unfolds. Um, but yeah, I would think that cooperating around green development aid um, and sort of high quality infrastructure projects is uh, one where there's really a lot of potential and the United States will hopefully be investing more in that direction. Uh, you know, I think that the, these acts in Congress that I mentioned are placing a somewhat zero sum emphasis on this as well. They are sort of framing these as means to counter the Belt and Road Initiative and um, you know, requiring reports on any countries that receive aid from not just the Belt and Road, but any sort of Chinese development banks, export import bank, or even the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which of course is not solely a, a Chinese initiative. Um, so sort of not necessarily penalizing that, but sort of viewing that as, as uh, something that needs to be reported on as a way of sort of emphasizing maybe this need to make countries choose. So I guess just to sum up, I would say that there are many ways in which U.S. strategy, I think, needs to change. And actually, I would hope that it would move closer to the EU's and the ASEAN's Indo-Pacific approaches, um, which are more inclusive, less zero-sum, more stabilizing. Um, and I'm hopeful that ASEAN and the European Union can help leverage the United States in that direction. Thank you very much, Rachel. So a very strong uh, plea there, Gunnar and Lewi, um, that you should actually, ASEAN and the EU should actually use their influence over the United States to rein in some of the extremist elements that we may be seeing uh, in the future uh, from the Biden administration. Let me now turn to some of the questions that are coming in. Um, uh, two questions, one from Noel Clayhan from the ASEAN Business Council and also from Ayana Dreyer from Borderlex that have to do with the trade question and which is basically, Gunnar, I guess to you, uh, a lot of the questions are to you actually, about uh, EU ASEAN FTA. I mean, um, it, it isn't mentioned, says Ayana in the strategy. Once again, you know, some of us have gone through it with a fine tooth comb and found, found some missing links there. So there's that question on... Um, on ASEAN. Um, there's also a question from Andrea Streichnitz, Streichnitz 
Um, is the strategy an element of the strategic autonomy concept that the EU is developing? So that's uh, one. Um, and there's also a question coming in, excuse me, some of the questions are a bit long, so I have to shorten them. How do you see the EU's maritime security strategy evolving in the Indo-Pacific from Jayesh Khatu? Uh, also a question saying, would it be possible for the EU uh, to uh, match the regional cooperation uh, economic partnership? Um, that's from Ayana as well. Um, let me just see quickly. Um, so Jan von Herf is also asking about ASEAN and uh, trade and economic cooperation between the EU and ASEAN. Um, uh, is the EU helping the Indo-Pacific during the pandemic, for example, now uh, in India, where we know there's a terrible crisis underway, even as we speak? Um, also take notes, Patrick Kugel from PISM in Poland says, uh, could you how say the ASEM process relates to the new Indo-Pacific strategy? Can ASEM play a major role in the Indo-Pacific? Um, that he shares our passion for ASEM, uh, Lewi. Um, and then there are questions coming in also about the East Africa side of the strategy. Um, and I think that's something that we need to talk about a little bit. This is from Timothy Walker and uh, also from Dennis Raver. So a lot of interest and questions there. Let me just see if I've missed anything. Uh, I have not. So let me turn to you, Gunnar, because I think people have asked you most of the questions. And there's also this, uh, let's say, uh, challenge that Lewi has uh, set forward uh, very much uh, on, uh, will you be, are you reacting just to the US uh, and, and China, or is this something authentic related to our uh, European strategic autonomy? Screen's yours. Well, let me start with the last one and also say a bit about China. Uh, the, 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 the elephant in the room, as some people say, um, the um, EU would never do something because the US tells it to do something. I mean, that one should have realized over the last um, decades of European integration. Uh, the EU does something with its partners when it is convinced of the necessity to do this with its partners. And uh, we are convinced that indeed there are many areas where we need to work well with the United States, whether this is on climate change, whether this is on Iran, whether this is on the reform of the World Health Organization, whether this is on the reform of the World Trade Organization. So we welcome the return of the United States to be an active player in the multilateral context. And we welcome also that there's a readiness to address many of the bilateral issues between us, which have not been addressed over the last couple of years. And we welcome that we will have very soon an EUS summit in Brussels, and that hasn't taken place in a long time. And we welcome that we have a dialogue with the US on China, which had been launched at the end of the last administration, but will now start in earnest. Um, but the US has not asked us to do an Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, that is a myth. Uh, and um, when you look at the leaked or consciously leaked reasoning for the US Indo-Pacific strategy under the Trump administration, uh, which was coming out shortly before the end of the Trump administration in a declassified document. Mm -hmm. Well, that is not, I, I, I don't want to speak for the US, but uh, Rachel hinted at this, that the Indo-Pacific strategy of the US may be interpreted first and foremost as a coalition building effort under the previous administration. So that is not the approach which we take. And I think this was recognized by, by all of you and by reading the conclusions. Um, we believe uh, sincerely in the cooperative approach, knowing that we have much more in common with like-minded partners uh, when it comes to human rights, good governance, democracy, but also um, when it comes to certain interpretations of how multilateral organizations should uh, function. But we need to work with partners in many areas, even if they are not like-minded. 
We have that approach in our policy towards China. We call it the multifaceted approach. We need to cooperate in many fields. No successful fight against climate change without the 28% greenhouse gas emitter called China, or indeed with India as well, or indeed with the US as well, but China is the largest emitter. Uh, no uh, successful fight against the loss of biodiversity than with China. No successful fight against systemic overfishing in the Pacific and Indian Ocean than with China. So regional, but also global, uh, global, but also regional challenges, Korean Peninsula, Myanmar, Afghanistan. Of course, we need to work with China and with other partners. Um, so that is the European approach. We don't want to put people into a corner. We want to engage people. And um, therefore, um, yes, we will have many opportunities to work much closer with the US on the region, with Australia, with Japan, with New Zealand, with Korea, with India, who all have um, such Indo-Pacific policies and indeed also with ASEAN with its Indo-Pacific outlook. But there are differences between the one and the other partner. And we add now a specific cooperative element into all of this. Uh, we have uh, identified the geographic space in order to be more concrete and more operational and not just declaratory. So our Africa policy will have to cater more for the needs in the wider region. And we have to look more at the needs of East African partners who are all parts of Indian Ocean Corporation. And Madagascar is the seat of a regional organization for the Indian Ocean. So we cannot just have our Asia Pacific uh, hat and not look at what our colleagues dealing with the Gulf or dealing with Africa do. Um, and um, of course, the Pacific Islands are a very important uh, part of uh, this overall equation. Now, with um, uh, 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 with with um, uh, China, just to to add that um, we uh, do um, work, of course. Uh, with difficulties in certain areas, as the recent sanctions on Xinjiang have shown, uh, and the counter retaliation by China has shown. And um, the uh, red zone, the red, uh, the red lights, sorry, the red uh, um, lines. lines, there we are, the red lines, which we have with flashing lights, uh, when there are massive violations of human rights, they, we, Europe will always be very outspoken, will be as outspoken as the United States, as the United Kingdom, as Canada, as Australia, and as other partners who are like-minded. And um, these uh, partners know, and um, this will be the case in our bilateral relationship with China, but it will also be the case in other such situations as uh, the Myanmar coup, which was recently referred to. Now, the questions which have come up. ASEAN FTA, while well, there is an existing mandate, um, the key is that we have a critical mass building blocks in place with meaning a deep and comprehensive ambitious FTAs with several of our ASEAN partners. Vietnam and Singapore are such cases. Uh, the negotiations with um, yeah, Indonesia are going on and uh, hopefully they can be resumed also with other partners such as uh, Malaysia and Thailand where the mandate exists but the negotiations are not taking place right now. That would create a critical mass because we know that the EU ASEAN agreement as such, similar to RCEP by the way, would be much more shallow and would have, would have a number of horizontal uh, disciplines but not a deep liberalization as you can achieve it in a bilateral agreement. So our priority are the deep uh, and comprehensive coverage in bilateral agreements, but that does not preclude that uh, at a later stage, we go into an EU ASEAN FTA. Secondly, is it part of strategic autonomy? Well, I think the pandemic has brought to the forefront the discussion about global value chains about strategic dependencies, strategic vulnerabilities, 
Uh, next week, the Commission will uh, publish um, the communication on uh, uh, the situation of European industries with regard to such uh, vulnerabilities. And um, there are, I think, in all of our countries, efforts on the way to identify which are strategic vulnerabilities. Is it in the defense sector only, mm. or is it also in the health sector? Is it related to rare earths, which are key for digital and for um, uh, green economies? Um, is it uh, with regard uh, to um, uh, other key uh, high technologies? And for us, the Indo-Pacific work is very important in the sense to, that A, we ensure the safety and security of maritime lanes. Just one accident in the Suez Canal recently has shown how critically global value chains are affected by a physical barrier like the Suez Canal suddenly not being possible to be used when we have 40% of global trade going through the Strait of Malacca. And we have to have the security of the maritime lines in short which leads the EU to have the concept now explored of creating coordinated naval presence mm -hmm. in such areas, uh, which answers the maritime strategy question. So apart from our existing military mission in front of the Horn of Africa, at Atalanta, uh, apart from our cooperation with Coast Guards, Climario, we are working more now also on the wider maritime security questions, which would include some form of naval presence in a coordinated way. And lastly, um, uh, of course, the EU uh, with an ASEM uh, forum, uh, where we have all partners from Asia together, uh, will have a distinct profile with an additional region-wide type of activity under the Indo-Pacific. I think it will uh, enliven and um, they contribute to more in-depth uh, discussions, uh, but it is not that ASEM should be the executive board for uh, doing all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunnar, for uh, tackling all these issues. There's one question now from Johannes Alfeld that I think is important for you to answer, and then I'd like to turn to uh, Rachel, Sunil, and, and Lewi for just a one-minute response to some of the issues. I think for you, Rachel, obviously the court should be one since you've just held a big uh, event, a very important event on that. Good. Now the question from Johannes is about money uh, for the connectivity uh, scheme, uh, the strategy, uh, saying that you know if you're going to quote unquote, counter the Belt and Road Initiative, you need to be doing more than just norms and standards, also bringing some funds, some financing for projects. So very quickly, if you could answer that. Thank you. It's obvious. Uh, the first answer is uh, we are not a state economy and we are not sending state uh, companies to make investments financed by state banks. Uh, this is these are free decisions of our private business having said this uh, there will have to be additional efforts by our private um, finance uh, institutes and the public finance institutes to indeed more consciously and better cooperation in better foresight mode to support investments uh, by uh, european business operators that's the first answer. The second answer is, as, as far as public money is concerned, uh, you will see that in our new uh, programming for the next seven years and the multi-annual financial uh, framework, uh, there will be uh, many more connectivity related uh, activities financed under the top priorities, which is uh, green economy and digital economies. And um, uh, this can be sometimes just national, more often they would be sub-regional or regional. Uh, but I cannot go into more detail on this right now, but we are in the finalization of the decisions on this uh, for the uh, next um, for seven years starting this year. Okay, so watch this space as we say. Thank you very much uh, also for giving this 
us this heads up on what to expect uh, on many of the Indo-Pacific issues we've talked about. Guna, thank you. Rachel, let's have a quick one minute intervention from you, then Sunil and then Dewi. Yes, thanks. On the subject of the Quad, I think it's clear that thus far there's more continuity, I would say, between the Biden administration and the Trump administration than similarity between the Biden and Obama approaches, despite the fact that many of this, the sort of architects of Biden's Asia policy hail from the Obama administration. I, and I think where you see this most clearly is regarding their approach to the Quad versus ASEAN, where Obama clearly placed a, a strong emphasis on ASEAN you know, from the outset of his administration and stressed ASEAN centrality. Um, that became much more neglected under the Trump administration. And although ASEAN was still mentioned in the Indo-Pacific strategy that Guna referred to, it was, not, um, it, it was not phrased in terms of ASEAN centrality, but rather the need for ASEAN to be strengthened to serve the needs of East Southeast Asia, rather than as sort of central to um, Asia, broader Asian regional, regionalism. And of course, the Trump administration really stressed, this, stressed the quad and as especially its security aspects and as a means to counter China. And not just Trump, but also of course his partners in, in these other three nations. And Abe had originally conceived of the idea when he was first prime minister. So the, the star is really aligned behind the quad, but the Biden administration has continued to stress that, has already had this quad summit. And um, of course they will continue to get, engage with ASEAN and, and increase, increase that engagement vis-a-vis -vis the previous administration. But um, I think that you know the, uh, this is understandably raising some concerns um, in in ASEAN and other nations, and uh, I I you know I, I think that again this is an area where it's important for countries in the region and elsewhere to communicate their concerns to the Biden administration and to ensure that the Quad has a more inclusive and expansive and open approach um, rather than being a, a club of four. So. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'll turn to you, uh, Sunil, but first I'd, let me just read out a, a comment that the ambassador of Bangladesh to the EU, Mahbub Saleh, has put on the, on the questions. And you, I think, referred to a meeting between the US and Bangladesh. Uh, and he says that the um, communique that came out said that uh, US and Bangladesh share a common vision of a free, open, inclusive, peaceful, and secure Indo-Pacific. And he said, let's be clear, Bangladesh can come up with its own strategy if it wants to, but it cannot participate in others' strategy. It's about sharing the vision, not the strategy. Mabu, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, Sunil, just a very quick uh, response to what you've heard from Guna and to the questions. Just a minute, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sada. It's good uh, to hear. To hear. And let me say, you know, like uh, about the, uh, you know, quad, like, you know, it's basically upon the uh, free and open, you know, supporting the democracy and development uh, cooperation. And, you know, Japan is one of the member of the quad and Japan has the greater, you know, uh, bilateral cooperation with Nepal as well as with the South Asian countries, including Bangladesh and India. And I think, you know, South Asian countries um, uh, will welcome much more to the uh, development cooperation than the uh, military cooperation. That is what I feel here in Nepal or in Bangladesh or in Sri Lanka or in India. And it's still uh, what I feel is uh, SARC is uh, not functional. Even the uh, sub-regional uh, mm. organizations like BIMISTEC, which uh, you know, uh, was mentioned by the previous speaker, even the BIMISTEC uh, somehow uh, not uh, proactively working uh, in the region for the cooperation. And I will tell you, like, you know, just uh, two days back, China organized uh, uh, Himalayan Quad uh, meeting that was envisioned by China and uh, the purpose uh, which was mentioned uh, about the humanitarian cooperation and now the the China under the leadership of China they are going to set up the humanitarian cooperation uh, to fight against the COVID-19 you know so uh, you know lots of you know these uh, you know uh, multilateral or let's say the quadrilateral you know the bilateral you know mm. organizations are coming up but what I feel in South Asia is nothing has been materializing in a very proper way. Yeah. So in this context, what I feel is like how this, you know, Indo-Pacific strategy will work because we are already part of the uh, Asia-Pacific uh, cooperation with the EU or with the uh, European right. Union, even the Nepali army, they are associated with, with the, uh, right. you know, this uh, Asia-Pacific uh, terms. So, so let's see I, how- I, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're really yeah. running short of time. But uh, you said we're going to not a panacea and obviously not. But looking to you in a sense to revitalize some of these dormant, yeah. uh, underperforming yeah. organizations in South Asia. So you have to pick up that challenge from Sunil. Yeah. Um, Lewi, uh, final words, please. Thank you. I would like to talk about the EU ASEAN FT. I think Realistically, it's quite difficult now with the coup in, in Myanmar and all that. Uh, so, so I think this, but also I think the fact that we have not thought of how we could proceed, for instance, with an EU ASEAN. So if you think the FTA is a bit complex, what about an EU ASEAN investment agreement, right? You, we have, EU has placed a lot of effort in trying to have a comprehensive investment agreement with China, but yet, the kind of focus, the kind of uh, interest and all that is not shown when it comes to dealing with ASEAN. And I think that is one of those things you perceive from, from, from our region, right? We could have thought of sectoral yeah. agreements and, and an investment right. agreement, which is very important. Last thing I just wanted to see. Very was, quickly, Lewi, because yes, Gunnar has to yes, go. You yes. Know, you know, the fact sheet on Indo-Pacific uh, put forth the justifications that the Indo-Pacific matters with the EU because it produces 60% of global GDP, over 60% of global trade, and is home to three of the largest economies outside Europe, China, India, and Japan. Similarly, if you look at the fact sheet for ASEP, right, it represents 65% of global GDP, 55% of global trade, and though not in the fact sheet, it is also home to the large, three of the largest economies outside Europe. There's China, there's India, and there's Japan. So if I take this a little further, you know, where I concluded in my agreement again, I think the Eurasian strategy would have to think more holistically and deeply about how the EU would like to engage Russia, which should be one of its key priorities, right? And that's why I thought about what is the strategic autonomy of the EU in thinking of its own priorities. And at the same time, how to engage China that is increasingly uh, in its own backyard. And that's why if I say, if I'm an EU policymaker, I will give priority to a Eurasian strategy rather than an Indo-Pacific strategy. And, and, and an end with that provocative note. So Lewi, that can be a nice op-ed that you and I can perhaps uh, cooperate on writing. Uh, that's, that's a good idea. Gunnar, you wanted to come in for a quick minute. At some point in the distant past, when I was director for Eastern Europe, uh, we had the vision uh, shared with Russia of uh, a free trade area from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Unfortunately, there have been decisions by President Putin which have made this distinctly impossible. Um, but it is our direct neighbor and very close to us, of course, as it is also the neighbor of a number of Asian uh, nations. Um, that's, on the US, I appreciate the comment by Rachel that this administration seems to be closer to the Trump administration than to the Obama administration when it comes to Indo-Pacific, even though it's the same uh, people who had done the pivot to Asia uh, or to the Indo-Pacific under Obama. I wanted to make one uh, exception, however, of this observation, which is, of course, a pure US internal observation, but the the way this administration deals with uh, friends and partners and allies is significantly different, not only to the Trump administration, but also to the Obama administration. And uh, the fact that we are having intensive uh, transatlantic uh, dialogue on so many issues uh, reminds us of previous administrations and uh, is a definitely a source of strength and, and inspiration uh, for both sides because this is on the basis of equality and on the basis of listening to each other. Um, the uh, other announcement I wanted to make is, this is not our last word, the uh, council conclusions. Uh, the ministers invited us to come forward with a more detailed uh, submission of a joint communication between the commission and the high representative, where we will detail the concrete implementation actions, either things which are already been done and are now being put into the regional context better or uh, new actions. Uh, this will be issued in September. Uh, and we are doing now intensive outreach to our partners, be them the like-minded or be them the regional and some are both. Uh, there will be an Indo-Pacific specific discussion next week 
at the occasion of the G7 foreign ministers meeting in London, where several partners participate, India, Japan, Korea, ASEAN Secretary General and ASEAN Chair. And of course, uh, my boss, the High Representative will contribute to that, who also intends to travel to the region. Now uh, we can start uh, with uh, vaccination having more and more success. So he will be um, certainly at the Shangri-La event in Singapore, and he will interact then with many uh, partners. And I expect our presidents also to be in the region a bit later in the year when we have key um, uh, top level events, including the famous ASEM summit in Cambodia at the end of November. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunnar. So that makes it especially important that we keep talking about the Indo-Pacific to try and get our points of view across to all these wonderful policymakers. And uh, I'd just like to end by saying um, a couple of things that I think is uh, I think are important. So uh, I think it's important, uh, Gunnar, that the EU does bring a non-hard security angle to this conversation, makes it more inclusive, broader, and more nuanced rather than just hard security oriented as some of the actors there are doing. And this is, I think really is an important value added in addition to the connectivity and rules-based order that you have discussed, because it's not really just about geopolitical competition in the region. It's also about recovery from a pandemic. And we know what devastation this is causing in a country that is dear to all our hearts, India climate change, uh, and of course, journalists under pressure, civil society under pressure, ethnic minorities under uh, pressure. So EU is important with its uh, value-based agenda also in that region. The one danger, actually two dangers, um, one is that we tend in the West to over-romanticize our friends and over-vilify our competitors and rivals. China is not 100 feet tall, as some have said, and uh, not all democracies are playing by the rules that we in the West uh, adhere to so much. There is good, the bad, and the ugly in all parts of the world. Implementation and coordination, Guna, we haven't talked about, but this is going to be key uh, among EU institutions, EU member states, so big role there for the External Action Service, of course, as well. And finally, I'd like to say thank you very much. Really appreciate the fact that you are so engaged with think tanks, with civil society, not just with the diplomats and the, and the business leaders. This is very important for uh, think tanks like the EPC and others uh, across the world. Thank you very much for joining us, Rachel. Thank you for coming in so early. Go and have your breakfast now. Lewi, you can have the gin tonic that you're probably hoping to get. And soon you'll maybe a late lunch uh, in Kathmandu. Thank you all for your participation, for your questions, and for your interest. Thank you very much. So watch the space. We'll be back. Bye-bye. Salam. Namaste. Much.